You remember when I said in the first episode of this show that I would try to stay away from anything relating to politics? Yeah, this might have to be an exception, no thanks to the results of yet another controversial British referendum. I may well be stepping out of my depth in this scenario, but it's an issue that's been making headlines since the middle of 2016, so it kind of makes sense to talk about it at some point. To those of you who don't know what's going on, there's been a hullabaloo in recent months regarding the introduction of driver-only operation, or do, on Southern Rail services. This has resulted in strike action from ASLEF and the National Union of Rail Maritime and Transport, or RMT, taking place on various dates from December and through to the beginning of 2017. The current situation, I shouldn't need to remind anybody of. It's deadlock with two sides unwilling to compromise, unable to reach an agreement, and commuters stuck in the middle with no choice but to stick it out. The strike action has disrupted thousands of commuters' lives, forcing people to give up jobs, break up relationships, and even relocate just to make life more tolerable. Not so much of a problem if your life allows you to live and work with comfortable flexibility, but not everybody has that luxury. Now I'm not going to point fingers at who's to blame for it, or what should have been done, or that a fictional fat man in a top hat can run a better railway than Southern, because we already kind of know that by now. Even without the strike action, Southern were reported to run the most unreliable rail service in the UK. But it's been made worse by these strikes because not everybody seems to understand why they're taking place. The current way of thinking with driver-only operation is the role of any additional member of staff to the driver is usually downgraded from guard to onboard supervisor, or OBS. The OBS no longer has control over closing the doors at stations, which people seem to think is all they seem to do. No thanks mostly to the press focusing in on this particular aspect of DOO. But the guard is also there to, amongst other things, check tickets, prevent antisocial behaviour, and most importantly, in the event of an emergency, legally disembark the train and walk along the trackside to get help, or help passengers off to safety. In order to do this, guards have to be extensively trained in route knowledge and personal trackside safety. But according to union representatives, the supervisors will not be given such route knowledge training or be cleared to walk along the trackside, rendering them legally useless if they need to disembark the train away from a station or tell the emergency services where they are if they break down in the middle of nowhere. And while do is in place on one third of the UK's rail network, you have to ask where the common sense is with train operating companies employing what could be potential trespassers who don't know where they are. Here's my point. Driver-only operation is in place, and in many cases, like the London Underground, it has proven to work. Even driverless trains working on computerised automation have worked for well over 20 years. So do is already in use. But, and this is where the confusion over whether or not it works comes from, it does appear to have less of a margin for error, which is exactly the point that drivers, guards and unions are trying to get across. This isn't just a fear of fare dodgers or aggressive behaviour or being unable to potentially help disabled passengers to get on and off trains that don't have a supervisor on board, but the increasing responsibility that seems to be laid upon the driver, especially when it all goes wrong. Instead of having an extra pair of eyes and ears to close the doors and tell him when it's safe to proceed, the driver has to rely on a series of CCTV cameras mounted over the doors which, unless these photographs are the result of a few hours on Photoshop, could be potentially useless in adverse weather conditions. Not only that, but there are first-hand testimonies that the drivers are not in the best position to deal with certain circumstances. I'm an ex-train driver. Up to about six years ago, I worked for Southern, who were a very good company to work for. I've worked at different depots. Uh, I've worked DOO and non-DOO. And I can say categorically, you can run a train service DOO However, on the events that have happened to me over a period of years, the travelling public are far less safe on a DOO train than they are when there's a guard on board. Stands to me, I've had stabbings which couldn't be investigated early enough. I've had mass gang fights, let alone inconvenience. In an ideal world, they should all have a safety trained guard. Now, driver-only operation is implemented in everyday use on the London Underground, but the London Underground is a different scenario to the national network. The average time between stops on the tube is two minutes. Nearly half of it's protected from the elements underground, thus keeping it clear from adverse weather or stray animals. Every tube station has TFL ticket barriers, thus preventing fare dodgers. And the top speed that a tube train is currently allowed to reach is 60 miles an hour. 
Many national rail stations do not have ticket barriers, and the London to Brighton line is clear to run their trains in some places at 90 miles an hour, even if they don't reach it. Charles Horton from Southern Rail may have implied the company is not planning to reduce its staff levels, but at no point in the BBC One debate on January the 9th did he say there was going to be a supervisor guaranteed on board every train. What we've guaranteed is that we will roster a second safety trained person on as many trains as had them before we started. <laughs> this pause raises so many questions, but not half as many questions as the circumstances in which a train is actually allowed to be dispatched with just one member of staff on board. You say you'll put a second member of staff on board, but in exceptional circumstances, that may not happen. In exceptional circumstances... Exceptional circumstances... So, so exceptional circumstances... In certain predefined circumstances, if we cannot get a second safety train person to that train, we will let that train go. See, the way of thinking here is, if a train doesn't have a guard to take it out, then said train would have to be delayed and eventually cancelled. So, if it doesn't need a guard or a supervisor to take it out, then it doesn't have to be cancelled and stands a better chance of leaving on time. Sounds okay if you just want your train to run and get you there. But here's the question that keeps crossing my mind as well as many other minds. Any train can have a crash and the driver is still the most vulnerable person on board. So what happens if the only safety critically trained member of staff becomes an ex-parrot? If the supervisor survives and needs to step off the train to help the passengers to safety, does that mean they have to say, Uh, sorry, I'm not allowed. The company says so. And that's if there's somebody on board in the first place. On February the 13th, the RMT reported that on the exceptional days when trains ran in January and February, an average of three trains a day were running without an OBS, which, if those three trains a day were running throughout the year, would work out at an average of around a thousand train journeys a year without an OBS. Again, any one of these three trains a day could have an accident, and even if there's just one passenger on board, it's difficult to put a price on just one life, let alone hundreds. People may think this is just a political uprising gone mad and that do is perfectly safe. The fact is, whether we like it or not, it's already in place on many parts of the network. But if the expansion of do is inevitable sooner or later, could it benefit with an increase in margin for error before it's too late? Just what are the exceptional circumstances that a train can be dispatched without a second member of staff on board? Why not train the supervisors to the same high standards as the guards with the same qualifications, so that if something does go wrong, there's someone there who's better qualified at helping survivors to safety? If this really is a case of who closes the doors, then why not just limit the changes to who closes the doors? After all, safety devices and practices have been refined or have been made universally compulsory as a result of a major disaster when Murphy's Law implies they should have been attended to before but were not because not everybody could see them coming. Automatic vacuum brakes were only made compulsory throughout the UK's rail network after 80 lives were lost in the runaway collision at Armagh. A form of AWS did exist before the heroin Wheelstone disaster, but its introduction was only accelerated on British Rail after 112 people were killed. If you go back far enough, the earliest trains didn't even have brakes. So if the Rail Safety and Standards Board had existed in 1830, what are the chances of them reaching the conclusion that trains without brakes are safe because nobody predicted William Huskisson was going to die of his injuries after being maimed by the rocket? Hindsight, it's a clever thing. Look, nobody can predict a disaster. I'm not assuming do is going to cost lives, and even if supervisors are trained to the same standards as guards, that still doesn't guarantee they'll survive a potential accident. But history has taught us the importance of bearing all risk in mind instead of being, what appears to be, economical on safety. And you don't need to have a PhD in the bleeding obvious to realise that a safety critically trained member of staff is more use in an emergency than just a member of staff. Adopting part-time, zero-hours, flexible methods of working may be well and good if you're running an entertainment complex or a retail outlet, but on public transport, people's lives need safeguarding with the maximum protection possible at all times. It's accidental reliance on the bare minimum in cases like these that by now really ought to be kicked. And before anyone automatically blames privatisation for this thing happening at all, the privatised Japan East Railway system employs a driver, guard and supervisor on board every single train. And yet the nation who made railways a form of public transportation can't have all three because... 
your assumption is as good as mine, I suppose. There's no way of telling when it's all going to end, and yes, the southern scenario is just the tip of the iceberg, but in a world when we complain about health and safety going mad, you'd think it would be going mad in the areas the general public not only want, but are probably going to need when it all goes wrong, whether they know it or not. And while it's clear there are areas where do is in everyday use, it begs the question how many people feel comfortable relying on the minimum obvious margin for error where the maximum obvious risk is still possible. We may not know how many people can answer that question now, but maybe it's for the best that those people don't have to find it out. Because if the worst does happen, some people will never find out. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.